Ashy Classy Spicy family. I hope and pray that everyone is doing exceedingly well today. Well today, as you can tell by the topic, I wanted to share a few tips or things that I actually learned over the last six years based on what happened in my marriage, the demise of my marriage, my divorce, the things that it taught me about love and men. Some of the things that I learned were very new. Some of the things that I learned were actually just confirmation of what I already knew, but just for whatever reason, I didn't put it into practice. So I wanted to share those with you because hopefully if you're going through something, maybe one of these things that I say will resonate with you and give you a different perspective uh, on that particular area in your life. Again, it is nine tips. And before we get started, I'd like to thank anyone who is new looking at the channel. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you stopping by and spending your time with us. I hope that you hear something today or see something that causes you to hit that subscribe button because we would certainly love to have you as part of the Sheet Classy Spicy family. If you are a current subscriber, thank you so very much for your continued support couldn't do this without you. So let's just dive in again. It's nine tips and this is what I learned about love and men. First thing, and I think this is probably the most profound thing. The one thing that I think really surprised me is that men are always true to themselves. I've been married twice and I have brothers and I have really good friends one of my best friends is a male and the one thing that has always seemed to be not seen has always been true is that they stick to their guns about what is important to them what they will and will not do it was something that I had to learn because I think a lot of times women we tend to accommodate what the man in our life wants or needs. Even if it's not comfortable for us, even if we don't like doing it, we will do it for them. But what I found is that most men, all the men that I know, they are true to themselves. I'll give you an example. If a man met you and you were small or thick, they usually don't veer from that. So if you gain weight or lose weight, they lose total interest in you. It's like, whoa, I had a baby or, you know, I had an illness. And even in some of those situations, they really don't care. They truly lose interest and they stick to their guns. However, women, on the other hand, if our guy gains a little weight or loses some weight, we do whatever we can to make them feel great about themselves. Matter of fact, we actually love on them. Now, a lot of ways, my ex-husband had some girth. He gained a little bit of girth and it was my playground. I still thought he was sexy. I still thought he was attractive. But when I gained a little bit of weight, he was not attracted to me. And he told me in no uncertain terms. I have my best friend, I told you, is a guy also and the same thing happened with him. Another friend, same thing happened with him. And it wasn't just about the physical that, you know, they stuck to in their guns in. But if you think about it, a woman will change the pillows on her bed. A woman will change the foods that she eats to accommodate the man in her life. Whereas I don't typically see men doing that. So I have to say that men are true to themselves and we as women need to learn how to be true to ourselves. If something doesn't feel right for us, if we don't like something, we need to stay true to ourselves and stick to our guns. And I have to say, although there are some things that I have changed in my current relationship, they are things that are good for me, that I will continue because they are good for me. Not because I'm trying to accommodate him, but because they are good for me. And that was something that I really had to think about because I started seeing myself doing things and I went, whoa, stop, pump the brakes. Care about them, but I do have to stay true to myself. So that was the first thing. The second thing that I learned about my marriage, love and men, is that sometimes love is not enough. 
And I know that sounds crazy, but sometimes love really isn't enough. My ex-husband loved me. I loved him, but it wasn't enough to keep us together because you have to understand what love truly is. You have to understand how love truly is supposed to function. You have to understand that love is a number of things that I, I will talk about in a minute that make it possible for a couple to stay together. And if you don't have those ingredients in your relationship, love will never be enough because there will always be something lacking in your relationship. And it was interesting because if you think about it in the movie, um, Tina Turner's movie, and her song at the end of the movie was What's Love Got To Do With It? And if you listen to the lyrics and you think about it, it makes perfect sense when I say that love is not always enough to keep a relationship together because you can still love that person, but they may not be good for you. You may not be good for them. You're just not good together, but you can still love them. And it, again, it finally dawned on me what that song meant that, you know what? She loved Ike and Ike may have loved her in his own way, but what the heck did love have to do with it when you're miserable? when you're unhappy, when there's no joy, your house is not a home, your heart is breaking even in a relationship. So again, sometimes love is just not enough. It needs some other things and we'll get to it. The first thing that love needs is it needs to be intentional. And I learned in my marriage and in my divorce that we weren't being intentional in the way that we loved one another. Sometimes I was intentional, sometimes he was intentional, but we weren't consistent. And to have a relationship that is going to be positive, that's going to be always growing, always loving, always passionate, always thriving in, in every arena, you have to be intentional about everything that you do. You have to be intentional about everything that you say and don't say. Being intentional, if you look up the definition in the dictionary, it says it is purposeful. It, everything you do has a purpose. So if I get up and I cook a hearty breakfast for my significant other, I have a purpose. That hearty breakfast is to feed him his soul and his body. But it's also letting him know that I will take care of him, that I am willing to take care of him, that I lovingly take care of him. So everything that we do when we're in a relationship with someone, whether it's your significant other or your friend or your children, your parents, whomever you love, it should be intentional. And it bring, brings back to mind the song that God is intentional. He's intentional. Yes, it brings back to mind because God doesn't do anything without purpose. And his purpose is to have us live life more abundantly, to share, for us to share the good news with others, to bring people to him. So everything that God does is intentional. He is a God of order. And in love, we need to be intentional. We need to have order so that we can have a relationship that truly is loving in every way. So that's the third thing. Number four, love languages are real and matter tremendously. Love languages are real and matter tremendously. Remember I said that my ex-husband and I had loved each other and we, we loved each other for a long time, 20 years to be exact. But throughout that entire time, even before we got married, I was always asking for certain things, my love languages. And some people would say, that's just a want. Mm -mm. It was not a want, they were true needs. And they never got met in a manner that was consistent. I was always empty. My bank account, my gas tank, whatever you want to call it, was always on the empty side. 
more often than not. And that was where we had so much contention in our relationship that I became a nagging person in some capacity because my needs weren't being met. I really needed my affection. I needed words of affirmation. I needed that and he couldn't give it to me. I don't know if it was that he didn't want to or if he couldn't. And I do believe that there are just some things some people just can't do. And the reason why they can't do it is because they haven't opened themselves up to something else that we're gonna get to on the list. And when you can't open yourself up to that thing, you can't be intentional and you can't do certain things that are required for your spouse, your significant other. And again, they aren't just wants. And you identify those wants, those needs, by doing self inventories and self introspection. And over the last five years, I did some, I read a couple of different books that helped me to see why these particular love languages were so relevant and so necessary for me to be happy in a relationship. They were truly needs and they came from my childhood upward. It's been something that I always needed. So love languages truly do matter. And if you've never read The Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman, I encourage you to pick that book up or buy the audio tape because those love languages don't just apply in romantic relationships. Those love languages apply in all relationships because you can't treat one friend the same way that you treat another friend because they don't receive things the same way. One friend may want to hear from you on the telephone and hear your voice another friend you can send them an email every six weeks and they're good you know so everyone is different because our love languages are different so again pick up the book if you haven't or pick up the audio I think it's a really really great book to have um, in your book collection number five love listens yes love listens intently love listens to hear to react in a positive manner, not to be reactive in a negative manner. They listen so that they can be proactive. Love doesn't make a person ignore or dismiss their feelings because they want to hear. They want to know what it is that is important to you, what hurts you, what makes you smile, what makes you happy what brings you to tears, whether they be tears of joy or tears of pain. So love listens intently so they can be proactive, but also react the way that you sh they should according to what your needs are. Again, you see how all of this is actually tying in together? It's pretty profound when I sit down and I think about how over the last five years, this has actually really cemented a lot of things for me. Number six, this is something that I had to learn how to do because it was very hard for me to just acknowledge that maybe some people really are who they are. You know, Maya Angelou said that when people show you who they are, believe them. We have to do that. A lot of times we go into relationships with rose-colored glasses on, and I will speak for myself. In my past relationship, the things that were writings on the wall, I thought that because we had been in a long-distance relationship, we weren't in the same state, that that's that was the problem. No, that wasn't the problem. The problem was I did not listen to my own intuition. God telling me I didn't want to see it because guess what we do things because he's a good man whatever it is because a lot of times we do these things knowing because we don't want to be alone we don't want to be lonely and I honestly I did get married the second time because he was a good man because I'd known him all my life because he did love me because he was kind because he was respectful because he wasn't abusive in any way because he was a good man by my definition of what a good man was. So those red flags that were there, I overlooked them and here we are, we're no longer married. 
Had I not overlooked those signs, I could have saved both he and I a lot of heartache, a lot of frustration. But at the same time, this was the plan that God had for me. So I had to go through this to get to where I am today to understand how love truly, truly is supposed to be. Yeah, accept people for who they are when they show you who they are. Number seven, loving someone is never about you. That's right, it's never about you. Love is the selfless act of giving to someone else because the only thing we want to do is show them how much we love them. We want to keep their, a smile on their face. We want them to be joyful. We want them to be happy. We want them to just know and feel that they are truly loved by us. Love is selfless. We make a choice so many times throughout the day to love someone. Sometimes you may choose every hour of the day to love that person. You may not like them, but you do choose to love them. And that's what love is all about. It's about making that choice to love them even when they are at their worst, when you wish they would just be gone. But you see the goodness in them. You see the greatness in them. You see the God in them. And not only that, you accept their shortcomings for what they are. They are imperfections that we can't change. The only person that can change them is them and they have to want to change them. And when they are ready to make those changes, God will give them the necessary tools, the strength to make those changes. But until they are ready, we have to love them in spite of those things that we do not like. Because guess what? They have to do the same thing. And that is being selfless and that is unconditional love. And every day that we say that we love someone, we're gonna choose a number of times to love them. Again, we may not like them, but we will choose to love them a number of times. It's selfless. And if you think about it, loving someone selflessly goes back to loving them based on their love languages, loving them intentionally, listening to them so that you can know how to love them, how to deflect some of the things that aren't necessarily positive about them. Yeah, a whole lot of things tie in together with this love thing. Number eight, you know, we hear that you should not be unevenly yoked with someone and most people assume that simply means when it comes to your faith. Well, it goes deeper than that. If you are unevenly yoked in the way that you think about disciplined children, the way you handle finances, the way you feel about faith, the way you feel about planning, things that are very important to the foundation of a relationship, your relationship, marriage, whatever it is, it could even be a friendship, is not going to survive. You have to be evenly yoked in major areas of your life. And it is something that requires concise communication. It requires you to ask questions. It requires you to take a look, step back in the beginning Watch that person and how they treat people, how they talk to people, how they act in certain situations, how they manage their money, how they talk to children. If they have children, how do they uh, discipline their children? How do, what type of relationship do they have with their, their baby's mother, their baby's father? All of those things have to be evenly yoked because when there is an imbalance in one of those areas, it is going to cause a lot of friction and frustration. Now, it's not going to be 50-50, but they do have to have the same mindset and be going in the same direction that you're going because if one is going left and the other is going right, you'll never meet. So you have to be evenly yoked. And one of the things in my relationship, in my former marriage, was that we weren't evenly yoked. We both believed in God, but 
I grew up as a Jehovah's Witness. I grew up studying the Bible. I grew up going to church Tuesday, Thursdays, and Sundays or the Kingdom Hall. I also went to Baptist churches and I had a different relationship with God than he did. He didn't even have a strong prayer life. Matter of fact, he did not like to pray in front of me. It took everything in him. It wasn't natural for him to pick up the Bible and read the Bible every day or every few days or whatever. And going to church was something that he was given a free pass on. He didn't have to go because his dad didn't go to church. So his mom went to church, but it was never something that was impactful in his life. So that was a big place that we were unevenly yoked. Um, the way we felt about discipline. My kids were much older than his child, but the way we felt about discipline was very different. And even though we made it work to a certain degree, there were, there were things that were very tough. Also, the way I handled money was very different than the way he handled money. I never needed a checkbook register to know how much money I have. I still don't use a checkbook register, and I can pretty much tell you how much money I have almost to the penny. I don't bounce checks and things, and he was constantly, you know, debit cards. You know, he would use a debit card, forget to write in his register and stuff, so forth. So it was a real source of contention for us. So we ended up having to get separate checking accounts because I was not trying to feel that. So as you can see, when you're not evenly yoked in very important areas, it really, really makes a difference and really puts a strain on a relationship. Number nine and the last tip is, I actually learned through my marriage or the divorce and my current relationship that love ain't hard. It really is easy. Because when you take self out of the equation and are giving to someone else and making them happy, usually most people, normal people, <laughs> will give back to you what you're putting out. It's just like the it says, what you put out there is what you receive back. It really is not that hard. It's intentional. Champagne, you listen. You give. You pay attention to love languages. You're, you're so involved with that other person. It's not that you forget about yourself because when you're given to that other person, it is making you feel so wonderful, so alive, so beautiful that you are making another person happy, joyful. Yes, love isn't hard. We make it hard. It really is easy. So that's what I learned about love and men through my marriage and through my divorce. And I'm so forever grateful. Although I'm sad that my marriage didn't work because everybody thinks their marriage is supposed to last forever. And really, if we put the work in, it really should. And work, not in a bad way. You say work, people think, no, not that kind of work. I don't mind putting in this kind of work. So, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the video. Tell me, did you learn something from your relationships that helped you to get a better understanding of what love is, what men um, believe, and how they act in love, you know, or even women if, if you're a male looking at this video? Leave it in the comments below. And also, if you'd like more videos like this, please tell me that as well and what topics you'd like to hear about. Finally, don't forget to follow us on our social media platforms. We are on Instagram, Pinterest, Twitter, Facebook, and in the next month or so, we're going to also have a blog online, which of course is going to be under the same handle, Chic Classy Spicy. Thank you again for hanging out with me. I hope I said something that was enlightening, inspiring, and you'll come back again and again. Until then, have an awesome one on purpose and keep it chic, classy, spicy.